Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Legendary Interviews series. I'm here today with Caitlin Rain, who is one of the talented artists working on the Heading Into Language Land card game. And when I first saw Caitlin's work, it was actually a very fantastical creature and beast, like a Medusa-like head. I don't know if you remember that, that, that piece that I'm talking I about. Do. I looked it up again today. That was really super cool. And that's what drew me in to, to, your, to your work. And then I also saw that you do really amazing characters with a lot of detail in their faces and uh, their expressions. So I knew at that point that I had to have something done by you. And thank you for coming on the channel today. And first question, can you tell us about your experiences learning foreign languages? Uh, yes, happily. Um, my experience is learning foreign language, which I studied Spanish in high school, like many kids growing up in Texas. And then uh, I actually was a Spanish minor in college. Unfortunately, if you ask me to speak Spanish now, I'm one of those people who understands more than they feel comfortable speaking. I never did an immersive experience, which uh, I think would have been really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. Additionally, my, I guess my most recent experience with language learning, my partner is from Myanmar. And so his family speaks Burmese when they're together. And I've been picking up a few words here and there, mostly, uh, you know, family members, titles and words for really, really good food. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm trying there. It's proven a little difficult because while I think of myself as a good mimic, there are subtleties in pronunciation of the consonants that absolutely escape me mm -hmm. so uh, that is really cool and I totally agree with you about the immersion part I wasn't so good in school myself and I forgot a lot of what I learned in school I actually took Spanish for three years as well in high school the third year was just to because I got such a low grade in the, the second year <laughs> um, <laughs> but nothing be coming to China and actually being in this country to help me really learn Mandarin. It's all around me every day. Okay, next question. Could you tell us about how you got into doing art? Well, I've always been someone who do, and uh, my, my sort of experience with art as an adult has come in a slightly more roundabout way. My professional background is in theatrical costume design. So in terms of sort of fine art, I'm completely self-taught and in digital art, absolutely self-taught. Um, and the skills I built up were to create costume sketches for first grad school and then as a professional. Uh, and so I think that background really informs my interest in character art mm -hmm. and creating realized um, and in detailed characters um, because I come from this place where I'm thinking about every single character in a play and mm -hmm. how they interact with each other where they came from what they had for breakfast that day and I think that's part of my process um, as a, an artist. Yeah that okay. makes it makes total sense now that you say that, because like I said, when I first found your work, the characters, like their expressions and their poses and their clothes just speak volumes to you instantly. And I also remember you sent me sort of a, like a spec sheet of all the information I could tell you about them, like their hair color, eye color, any tattoos, like their height, their weight. And I was like, this is so cool. How does, how does she take all this information on board into her mind and then whoosh, put it into a character? <laughs> it's funny. So that questionnaire that I created once I started um, doing this kind of fantasy art, custom fantasy artwork, which has come about since the pandemic because there's not a lot of live performance going on. Uh -huh. um, I created that questionnaire and that's what I use when trying to get into a character. And it is amazing how many people sort of hand wave it and say, oh, whatever you think. And how many people offer me, you know, a full novel. And, um, and while I appreciate the artistic latitude, it's, it's really, really helpful for as much as I can. And in many ways, my questionnaire would be much more detailed, <laughs> but I limit myself to, you know, this, this many questions. 
It's just how I, how I approach, approach a character. You reminded me about something because I saw uh, feedback. Uh, I'm almost totally positive. It wasn't on, on your page, but another artist's page, um, a customer left feedback was like, uh, yeah, this, this guy's artwork for me was great, but they asked me too many questions about such little details about my character and it seemed so unnecessary. And I was like, why are you doing a character commission? <laughs> I, I, so, so many, if not most of my uh, commissions come from people who want their role-playing game characters realized like Dungeons and Dragons or similar um, TTRPGs. And uh, th these are often characters people have lived with for many years, as I'm sure you have lived with your creations for Language Land mm -hmm. for a really long time. And you've, you've considered them and you know their backstory and all of that. And yes, it is just a simple picture. And it's, you know, a drawing of one character on one day of their life, if you will. But having that background really does inform the mood, the pose, the, you know, is, is this person modest are they clean or dirty are they you know, all these things are really helpful and i do think produce a more exciting and and vibrant sketch for me mm -hmm. and I, I would like to touch on one more thing that you just said which was your totally self-taught digital artist that mm -hmm. really blows me away because i have just a, a basic amount of experience working with actual paints and canvas and stuff and i felt that was hard enough to learn and nowadays with these digital programs, there's like a million buttons and, and functions and things you can do. And I'm, could you speak briefly about, you know, for younger artists who are getting into that, like, how did you do that? How did you assimilate all the, all that those digital programs can do without feeling overwhelmed? Well, it was little by little and it was often I'm trying to think how, exactly how I started. I was always interested in that because I wanted something that was portable. You know, mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to, to sketch and draw wherever I went. Um, as I started assisting designers at a really high level, they all do their own renderings, but sometimes they'd say, hey, I need this in purple or I need this. And so I became more competent with the photo manipulation mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. And from there started thinking, oh, well, I'd love to be able to um, uh, create my own things from scratch on here. Um, and so that's, I've been, I've been pretty handy and, and, and competent in a self-taught way with Photoshop for over a decade now, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, getting an iPad Pro and starting with Procreate, which is the program I use to create the works for you with some later tweaks in Photoshop was a game changer. Although I was very comfortable using a, a stylus and looking at a screen and drawing over here, being able to have something where I'm, it feels like putting pen to paper was a game changer. And that's not accessible to everybody, mm -hmm. but the basic ideas of what you do with layers, what you can do with, um, uh, you know, just the simple fact that you can undo things. Mm -hmm. I have become so comfortable with digital art that I have found myself sketching and thinking, oh, I can just undo that. <laughs> and then going, no, you can't. You have put a mark on a physical piece of paper. Uh, it has informed the way I approach my pieces because I can paint very, very broadly, very, very messily. And then I go back and clean up, mm -hmm. which is, possible but more difficult with physical mm -hmm. media so mm -hmm. uh now i consider myself almost fully a digital artist yeah that's really cool the last artist i had on gabriel he said something a little bit similar which was if you really want to get into doing work for people and commission work the digital technologies are really important because like you said you can undo you can adapt you can change colors and textures for people with a click I and Exactly. I mean, I will always have such a deep admiration for people who create physical media that is very difficult and I would like to get better at it mm -hmm. myself, but in terms of efficiency and, and flexibility, uh, it's hard to beat digital, which again, not accessible for everybody. And the basic building blocks of, do you understand how light hits an object? Do you understand texture and color and composition? 
those are not something you need digital media for. And obviously there are things I'm still working on and learning myself, but it, if you, if you can, I, I highly recommend adding it to your arsenal mm -hmm. as an cool. artist. Well said. Now I want to show the people watching two of the game cards that feature your artwork that we're going to talk about today. And uh, the first one we'll talk about is Kurgak. And the second one is the Wordsmith. So we're testing with the card game right now. And this is how it's looking with Caitlin's artwork on there. You can see it's really, really amazing uh, what she was able to do. And um, Caitlin, how did you feel when I first asked you if your art could be in the card game? I was really intrigued. This was one of the first sort of uh, uh, potential commissions I'd had for something that was not for just an individual, for something that was part of a larger project. And I was interested in the artists you'd previously used. I was interested in their approach and, and was happy to see, get a peek at some of that artwork and see where your building blocks were for this series. Um, you know, there was some challenge in terms of composition because obviously you need your text, you need the information mm -hmm. on these cards. Um, but it was, it was, as I said, intriguing. It's nice to do something different. It's always fun to do something brand new. Awesome. And uh, yeah, it's been a journey for me as well to learn how to work with artists because I'm, I have no training or background as an artist. So um, that's been really a great learning curve and experience for me as well. And I hope to do more interviews like this. And so not only the people, you know, the fans and followers watching, but other artists can see what other artists are doing to this project, in this project. And uh, yeah, maybe, you know, there can be more collaboration in the future. Now we're going to show you guys something really special, which is, um, Caitlin has, uh, she's going to share with us this video, or I'm going to share the video that she sent to me that shows um, in, in a time lapse her work on Kurgak. And just to tell you a little bit about him, he's sort of like, um, he's an emperor type character who lives in a city of fire wizards. And um, he's under pressure from the evil forces in the land basically to flip and become a pawn for them and help them to, to uh, carry out their dirty work. And so he's got a lot on his mind and he's, he's trying to decide if he wants to stay on the side of good or on the side of evil. And he's trying to think which side's gonna win out in the end, which side does he wanna be on? So he's really uh, strategic and plotting. And let's uh, hit up Caitlin's video here. I think you guys are really going to be blown away by this. Um, Caitlin, can you see this uh, screen share now? I sure can. Okay. Go ahead and tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here. I'm going to let this play all the way through. <laughs> well, um, the description you provided me was really, really evocative. And what you're seeing is I always use references. I start with references. And as you see, I, I do a little tracing, a little Frankensteining. I do different heads on different bodies, things like that. Um, I think that's comes from my training uh, as a costume designer because it is costume design sketches are intended to be sort of communicative tools. So you are getting out as many as you can, as fast as you can. But once I've done the initial sort of little trace to get the shapes out, um, I, I use the reference as is traditionally um, done, just looking back and forth and back and forth. For this guy, who I must admit is one of my favorite pieces I've done in a while, the description you gave me, you know, I felt like, okay, here's a person in his middle years who's incredibly powerful, who has a lot on his mind. Um, you know, I wanted to start with these really rich, fiery colors. I knew he was a redhead, which is actually not that easy to draw because red hair is, is, is very particular. Yeah. Um, I wanted him to look hulking and big and middle-aged, but not gone to fat. So you get this idea of a, of a warrior king. 
Um, and I was really interested in keeping the focus on the face and the hands and giving that um, sense of power and, and um, sort of, how do I put this? Uh, uh, not concern, but, but worry in mm -hmm. a way. Mm -hmm. um, and then letting sort of the, the robes and the background kind of meld into each other. So you get just this huge sense of mass Mm -hmm. um, as well as these these dynamic reds and oranges of of a fire of a kingdom of fire wizards, mm -hmm. um, and then I had this sword. I cannot remember if you wanted a sword or you said anything about a sword. I may have just gone with it on my own, and you approved it in the sketch phase. <laughs> I honestly don't remember. I don't think I did. I don't think I did. That was mm -hmm. a great choice. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, as you can see, I've gone back and forth on color. These little blue boxes are where I assumed the text would kind of go to make sure mm -hmm. that I was keeping the important bits, the hand, the face, um, clear of what text would be. And I think that's how it ended up on, on the mm -hmm. physical card, which is so much fun to see, mm -hmm. um, even, even through the video screen. Um, and here, you see, I'm, I'm adding more cloak. I've toned it into sort of a more deep mulberry raspberry i'm adding some texture to the throne it's mm -hmm. just been it's a lot of layering a lot of trying things out which is of course the beauty of digital that you mm -hmm. try something you scrap it you tweak the color balance you do all these things I, i'm adding some texture to a sort of ob style belt there some mm -hmm. some lapels sort of areas to his robe now the background i wanted to keep it pretty pretty vague and just a sense of heat and sort of a wall of fire, wall of force behind him. So you get this sort of punch of a personality through. Super cool. Yeah, I'm just captivated by it right now. It's <laughs> really fun to, to see it time lapsed and that's, you describe it. <laughs> that's a lot of, that's many hours. It goes, it does not go as fast as it does there. I'll tell you uh -huh, that. Uh -huh. And uh, was it you who first brought up the inspiration of Rembrandt? I don't remember. It may have been. I think I was, again, your, your description was so evocative. And uh, sometimes when the other details, like what is he wearing? You know, I, I think you said robes or something. It is helpful to me to think of other artists and what they how they have approached sort of similar subjects. And I'm not saying that looks like a Rembrandt, but the idea of light catching faces and the rest being a little muddied, a little mm -hmm, mm -hmm, receding. Mm -hmm. So character that's come forward um, was, was helpful for me in approaching Kyrgyz. Yeah, that was really cool, really cool. Oh my gosh, okay. Um, uh, I think, You've, we, we've talked about this a little bit, but maybe you can talk about it just a tad more. What kind of considerations or challenges did you face when you were uh, working on Kurgak? I know you mentioned the, the red hair is a challenge. Maybe you can talk about that or some other things. And I can actually, I can put up the um, photos so we can keep looking at it. I'll, I'll put up the game card. How about that? And uh, yeah, you can tell yeah. us about any challenges. That would be helpful. Well, um, the the composition probably was the first thing uh, that I would talk about, just because we're you've got something at the very top and then a big chunk of the middle. Uh, so making sure that the eye goes where it needs to go uh, mm -hmm. was important, um, and also knowing that you have to read the text on top of whatever I put. So I can't put a lot of complex shapes or dynamic colors or, or dynamics between colors behind, you know, the, the important text that people need to access easily and immediately. Um, uh, the musculature of the chest was not that easy for me. Red hair, you know, I really wanted it to be red you know how some people have this truly magnificent bright red hair and I was dealing with 
sort of different lighting dynamics um, that made, I really wanted to make sure the hair was catching the light in a way that it would show that beautiful color, mm -hmm. but keep the overall mood serious, even mm -hmm. somber. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have also found sometimes it is difficult with people with very light features like redheads um, to see, to make them seem really uh, uh, heavy for lack of a better mm -hmm. word, mm -hmm. present, dark, powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's also with redheads because often they're so fair you get a lot of variation of skin tone and trying to balance out. Also, you may have seen it. So I had these two major reference photos, a, a king on a throne, and then this, I assume he's like a professional wrestler or something. Mm -hmm. um, and the lighting design or the lighting schemes in those two pieces were very different. So using them as reference, but keeping the lighting consistent for my piece can be a challenge. Mm -hmm. Well, the final result is truly stunning. And this is a perfect example of how I wanted each game card to look because the text is readily visible to players. And it seems to be really perfectly balanced across the card with the character. And it was tough to get that look on, on all the cards. You know, some of the artworks for, for other landscapes or other characters was more light and more bright and that was difficult to get the text to read on those but this one mm -hmm. came out really perfectly and it fit the vibe of dark fantasy i'm very um, happy with it myself yeah you should be that's that's awesome i'm glad to hear that you really mm -hmm. enjoy to do it um now before we go on to the wordsmith um mm -hmm. where can people find you online or support you online Oh, thank you for asking. I am at um, illustratedspellbook.com. Illustrated Spellbook is the, um, the name I use for all my fantasy work. Uh, I'm also Illustrated Spellbook on Etsy, on Instagram, on Twitter, on pretty much every social media platform you can find. Um, it was sort of a random choice, but I like the name. And it, I like uh, it. I, I like to imagine, you know, all of these characters springing forth from a mm -hmm. bunch of spell books. So mm -hmm. illustrated spellbook.com is me. Yeah, I like the name too. And guys, I highly recommend uh, you you get some art done by Caitlin for, for whatever reason or purpose you have, because she's really fantastic to work with, a prompt communicator, able to make changes. She loves what she does. And you can see the quality of the work right here. Now let's get into the wordsmith. Um, so for this one, this is going to be really fun because uh, <laughs> I love this little guy. I kind of want to go back to this one. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Sometimes, sometimes your first sketches end up giving you, you know, a, a vibe that you chased for the rest of the, uh, the rest of the process. <laughs> he's, he's sort of a fun, sweet little guy he in is. some ways. So um, uh, for, for these, this character in the game is, is not, it's, uh, this game card is not a unique one. There will be duplicates of this game card and it represents the wordsmiths who are basically like blacksmith type characters. And they do a lot of metal work and also print shop work and printing. They don't have magic, but they're great with manufacturing stuff and inscribing stuff or etching stuff with the words. So they're great with language in that way. And so we have the wordsmith card and basically I was, I was coming, I, I knew he had, I wanted him to be tough as a lot of the other cards were turning out. And I was thinking of doing something like a really tough ass Santa Claus type, type deal. And I think uh, we ended up changing we we changed away from the sketch pretty quickly not through any fault of yours but i think in my description i didn't push it far enough and i quickly realized i i 
I not only need him to be more extreme, but I, I wanted him to be more extreme. So then I think I just messaged you back and I said, let's make him like a badass Santa Claus. And you were like, <laughs> I know what to do. I got you. <laughs> You're like, I got I you. <laughs> but, but looking at this sketch too, I actually really love it. And I think I can easily see him in the village as well. He's almost like a future older version of this guy that I'll, I'll show you now. <laughs> So let Could me. I, or I see, yeah, I seem sort of maybe one of the worker bees, and what we ended up with yeah, is the guy yeah. who owns the forest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So tell us about this sketch and how you felt about this character. And I know we there was a lot we had to do because I, I, I told you for this one, I would love for you to do a more detailed background. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, take it away. What did you do with this one? Well, again, the, the same the same challenges with composition were there. Um, and instead of, you know, you've got a person straight on and you get the full impact of their expression as we had with mm -hmm. Kyrgak, Kyr Kyrgok. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this one, it was as much about the range of motion as it was expression. And mm -hmm. then you got to fit it in this little, little card. Um, additionally, sort of finding reference photos that suited my needs were pretty difficult. So there are not that many blacksmith reference photos out there that, that were what I was looking for. So um, some challenges in terms of figuring out musculature and sort of how exactly what does a hammer look like as mm -hmm. you swing it down in motion, a lot, of, a lot of looking in the mirror or asking my partner to <laughs> hold still I took, took photos, uh, which is difficult because this is not his, his body type. Um, and again, in terms of the background, I knew, okay, we're going to have this, this forge fire. What do blacksmiths actually have in an old fashioned sort of uh, smithy? Um, and then for instance, the fire, obviously that glows, that's bright and it's going to have white text overlaid on top of it. So how do we balance these, these needs of, of, uh, reading comprehension and artistic expression. Uh, so the, and then lighting as always, cause you really want dynamic and powerful, mm -hmm. um, lighting in a blacksmith shop at all places. So that's, that's where I started <laughs> with him. Yeah. You bring so much in, you talk about the dynamism of the scene that really makes sense in your work you know it's the costume it's the lighting it's the posture at all there's so much well, there i when you have just this one image that you're trying to communicate so much mm -hmm. with i do think you throw as much at it as you can and hope that at least some combination of, of the elements you put in there communicates mm -hmm. what you need people to understand and you really saved me on this one because I was looking for reference photos as well because I, I don't understand really anything about smithing and exactly what type of tools are are used and how. And I was like, oh man, I, I couldn't find much out there when I was Googling for photos about it. And then you said, I, I think I have a good one. And I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that funny scritchy scribbling in the back um, on the front of the, the fireplace, those are these, they're these long, thin iron, I assume, tools that I yeah. saw in most spithies that, um, you know, they have different hooks on the end. They have different they look like a bunch of crowbars that are sort of weirdly shaped and they're all lined up on the front. So that's what that scribble is. And then I threw some chains in the back because I figured eh, it's going to have some chains somewhere. Chains are badass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's another a really impressive part about what you and other talented artists are doing is, is that ability to, when you, you don't, maybe you don't know much about a particular thing that you have to draw, but you need that ability to be able to research it and look it up, find the reference and bring it in. So that, yeah. that's pretty amazing too. Research is honestly one of my favorite parts of, of the process. And when I have people coming to me with things they've, you know, they're expressing from their imagination and they're often not have no basis in historical reality, but often <laughs> because they just think it's, they just think it's cool. And you know yeah. what? It's, it's for your own, for and from your own imagination. 
it doesn't need to be historically accurate. Uh-huh. That's not important. But often it can help to ground things in, in historical accuracy. Uh-huh. Or you need to think through the logic of, okay, you want armor made of glass. How would that work? What would you actually see? What would you wear underneath? That sort of thing. So the research yes. is no. yeah. a fun part of it. That last bit you mentioned too is interesting about how to sort of mediate what the customer wants because I know I'm sure I made artists pull out their hair on on many occasions because I think maybe you know some sometimes a request I had was very odd or very strange and sometimes I, I did have these little battles with artists about something that I really wanted but you know sometimes they were right and I I we went with their idea and sometimes I insisted on mine, but, but that's, you know, that's another interesting part of this because I don't know how to do art like, like you all do. So um, it's, that's tough for me is like, if I have a vision and I want to get there come hell or, or high water, sometimes I insist upon it to the artist's chagrin, you know, but I, I, I hope that sometimes I have the, um, the ability to, to realize when they're right on, on making the call on something like it could be the lighting. It could be where they're standing. It could be like uh, back, back to Gabriel, the other artists, like how would the arrow like be hitting the troll's body or like, uh, you know, sometimes the artists are really smart about those types of considerations. Like, Oh yeah, it wouldn't stand like that or look like that. You're right. You're right. So, I mean, that must be weird too. When a, when a customer maybe insists on a point that the artist thinks is really odd and then you just got to draw it and then maybe you feel like you ruined the piece. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I mean, there have, there have been a couple of occasions where somebody essentially throws so much at a character that it's hard to balance uh, busyness with clarity of, of sort of mm-hmm. intention. But I, try to of course you know people are hiring me right this is it it is a business relationship but i have found and again i think this comes from a background of working in a collaborative field that um sort of i like to view each piece as a collaboration between myself and the person who's commissioning me Mm -hmm. because i'm not coming up with the idea they're coming up with the idea i have hopefully the skill set to put it on paper, but, and, and hopefully what I bring is, okay, you think I, I have, again, armor made out of glass. And I say, okay, well, what if it was, you know, it had this sort of sheen going through it that was fine particles of metal that strengthened it. And they say, oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. So, so saying, here's what I bring to the table, which is an ability to put digital pen to digital paper, and you come with ideas, how do we create a product, a final thing together that is uh, both of our, Mm -hmm. it it is, it is, it comes from both of us. And we both feel happy and satisfied with what we have contributed together, which is more than the sum of its parts. Exactly. Exactly. Does it always work that way? Not necessarily, but that's, that's what I try to go for. That's a beautiful way to look at it and to summarize it. I hope that's happening with the game. And I I believe that it is because like you said, greater than the sum of its parts, the artists bring so many great ideas to this world that I'm trying to build and help me to flesh it out. Let's look at the final piece here. There it is. There it goes. Um, Yes. As you see, I switched switched him around, switched the figure around, uh, because knowing where the text would go, definitely wanted um, the the hammer and his gaze, uh, you know, to be more, felt more clearly, and uh, to give the impression of the swing, the arc of the hammer, and sort of the tension of, you've got this white hot blade waiting for it, mm-hmm. and you know, in your imagination, you may be able to see the sparks fly, even though you're not seeing it right there. Um, I also was able to get some really nice backlighting on him by switching mm, the figure this mm, way. Mm. And 
and from a practical point of view, was able to obscure a little bit of the fire so the white text on it wouldn't mm -hmm. wouldn't be itself backlit and difficult to read. Mm -hmm. So uh, awesome! Wow, yeah. so much thought. It's funny. I did, and I worked on this for quite some time, and I'm very pleased with the result. But you know, I've stepped away from it for maybe a month, a couple months now, and you know, you see things again and you always see things you want to tweak, but mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's nice to, it's nice to see it again. And so exciting to see it in card form. Yeah. I love it. And I'll mention here too, that another great thing about working with Caitlin was she'll, she'll keep providing options and ideas. And I remember you saying, you know, I could do this for, for less money if you wanted me to, by putting a shirt on him because it's going to take <laughs> me more time to do the muscles. And I was like, oh, I thought about that for a minute, you know, that's really nice of you to do for customers to give them sort of levels of pricing and show them different things and let them make a choice. And I just, I, I really wanted to see you do that. And it looks, he looks so tough in the end for having, having done it this way. I'm, I'm happy with it. Uh, and to be completely transparent, the reason I said that is because I did have good research photos, but it was somebody in a really baggy shirt so I knew that it would take more of my time and time being money um, to do them shirtless, but I, I'm glad this is how we, where we ended up. I think yeah. it's, it's a better, a better end result. And, you know, in terms of offering flexibility in that way, I, I do try to offer that for people because again, most people have been conceiving their characters for a really long time. They feel really emotionally attached to them and mm. they don't have the the skill set at present to see them realize you know maybe but a sketch or a pen and ink version you know something that can get something on a page for people to see their imaginations realized is always mm -hmm. something i i'm happy to do cool very well put indeed now, uh, just a, one final question for you. I was wondering, what would be your biggest piece of advice or a uh, takeaway that you would like any beginning artists who may be watching to have? Well, um, I think, I think, I think, um, and there will be people who are better than you are. There always are, but that's no reason not to give it a go. That's especially if you're trying something new like digital art, or if like me, you've been away from doing fine art for a while and you come back to it uh, either for pleasure or because of unforeseen circumstances like a global pandemic. Um, and the skills of observation of imagination all these things are muscles that uh can be can be exercised into good use Just, mm -hmm. you gotta you gotta put in the hours mm -hmm. so i think that's true for beginner artists no matter where they're coming from thank you for that thank you so much for coming on and um i really hope we'll have the chance to work together some more on uh the second addition to this game. It's been a pleasure to work with you so far. And guys, if you have any questions or comments for Caitlin or I, leave them down in the comments section below. We'd be happy to start, uh, start the conversation with you there. Caitlin, thank you so much for coming on. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Nice to talk to you.